Today, Chloe and I talk about squats. We talk about a lot of the alignment protocols, which all turn out to be elephants, spoiler alert. Things like, is there a correct foot placement? Does it matter whether your knees go forwards or inwards or outwards? Should you, How important is it to keep neutral spine? And can we even tell if someone's in neutral? All of this and more coming up. Hey, Raf, how are you going? Yeah, I'm awesome. How are you? I'm okay. I'm okay. I think it's a sad day in uh, music history today. Uh, Timestamp, Charlie Watts has just, just passed away of uh, the drummer from the Rolling Stones. Gone to rock and roll heaven. Yeah, I'm sure there's, there'll be a lot of Rolling Stones being played today. I've already had a, had a good listen and I think I feel like there'll be Rolling Stones being played all around the world right now. And a lot of mourning. He was um, very loved and an incredible, an incredible musician. You a Rolling Stones mm. fan? Yeah, I like their later work. I'm not a big fan of their kind of I want to be your dog era. <laughs> yeah, stuff, right. Okay. You know. um, like I, I'm not really a big fan of that whole 60s, you know, wave, but I like I love their 70s, like, you know, Tattoo You, Start Me Up, Exile on Main Street, Sticky Fingers, you know, all of those ones I, I love. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And did you ever see them? No. I, I've, basically, I've hardly seen any bands live. I saw Pink Floyd live once like 30 years ago. Wow, that would have been amazing. Yeah. But, yeah, haven't, haven't really seen – never saw James Brown, never saw the Rolling Stones, never saw Heaps – Saw the Chili Peppers once back in the heyday. Oh my god, that would have been good. I I saw the Stones live and um, it was phenomenal, and I'm so excited. Uh, like I'm so grateful that I got to see them. The only annoying thing was behind, you know, we were up in. The, I mean, the tickets were outrageously expensive, and I I'd actually missed out on tickets. And I was just really lucky. One of my clients. This was when I was teaching Pilates in Melbourne back in the day, and uh, one of my clients said, "Hey." I, I've, I've got a spare ticket and the person I was going with has pulled out. Would you like to come and be my plus one at the Stones? And I was like, are you kidding me? Yes, I would love to. Uh, and so, you know, we were sort of, it was at the entertainment centre and we were kind of like up, up the wall and there was this uh, group of really drunk guys behind us who basically wanted to treat the whole gig like it was karaoke. Uh, and and I'm like annoying. I'm like, Mick Jagger is singing live in front of me right now. I'm here to hear him, not you. And I actually did say that to them. Didn't go down so great. In fact, it just amplified how loud they sung. So I ended up having uh, to just kind of go, okay, it is what it is. And <laughs> but that was painful. Yeah, but it was an incredible, uh, incredible gig. And um, yeah, I'm so stoked that I got to be part of that. Mm. How have you been mm. doing? Uh, I've been doing pretty awesome. I've actually been thinking about um, – this is something I've been thinking about because I've been talking to a, a lot of people in the US, a lot of instructors and studio owners. I, I don't know the exact number, but, you know, more than 20 that I've had, you know, sort of in-depth Zoom or phone calls with. And just to understand about – how the industry works over there and people's experience and to get to know our listeners. You know, I mean, I can't get to know all of our listeners, but it's it's really nice to connect with people. And, hey, if you're listening and you would like to have a chat, look in the show notes and you'll see a link to book a call with me. And I'd just like to understand your story, your history, your present experience of being a Pilates teacher or studio owner wherever in the world you are. Uh, whether you're in the US, the UK, you know, wherever else you are, you might be in the world. Uh, anyway, so yeah, I've been talking to a bunch of people, and one the thing that the probably the the one thing that struck me the most about the difference between the US Pilates world and the Australian Pilates world is just the number of the number of reformers in the room. You know, I think we've already talked about this on a previous episode, but in Australia, it's totally normal to have like 12, 14, 15 reformers in a room, and I'd say that is the norm. Um, whereas in the US, it's much more like five or six, and um, you know, and, and when I you know when I ask people, so why do you why do you why do you have five? Why not fifteen? 
you know, the most common answer I've got back is like, oh, quality, you know, I want to maintain quality. And, and you know, that doesn't really sit right with me because I've, I feel like, well, you know, I've had some pretty profound life-changing experiences where I've been in an audience of thousands or where I've been, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, so, you know like maybe a concert that, you know, you went to or a, a book that you read along with four other million people who read the book or, you know, a, a, some movie that you saw or a song that you heard on Spotify or something that you like had some kind of real change the course of your life type experience. And it's like, well, you know, you and millions of others of people, you know, can have that same experience. And I think, you know, that's what Charlie, you're talking about Charlie Watts makes me think that it's like, well, Charlie Watts never heard of you, you know, but that doesn't mean that he, his work can't have a profound effect on you, you know? And so I think, you know, then that just kind of the notion that we have to be in a small group to, to have a, a, a meaningful impact on people you know, doesn't ring true to me. Yeah, I agree. It doesn't ring too, true to me either. And uh, I feel like we 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 explored that quite well in the uh, our large classes yeah, dangerous yeah, episode. Yeah. So hopefully, I, if I, you, I'm still thinking about it though. <laughs> You're still thinking about it. <laughs> when when that episode comes out, uh, if you haven't listened, if you're listening to this episode and you haven't listened to that episode, have a have a little listen, pop it in your ears. But um, mm. yeah, we can you can definitely have a profound impact on people without yeah it needing to be. And also like it's a business. Like we've got to really you know if we I, the the narrative I keep hearing coming out of places like the US. Uh, when they're with the smaller groups, etc., is that they're struggling to to make enough money, and it's like, well, you got to have you got to have more more bums on reformers. So more well, bums on more reformers. It, you know, it's just it's time. It's it, it to me, it's interesting, Raph. Why it's been such a slow um, shift in the US seemingly and I'm just making assumptions here so please don't be offended anyone if you're listening to me I haven't been to the US and I know that there are some group you know I'm, I, Courtney Miller she's got she's got her awesome studio there's there's group Pilates there she's got yeah. what I can tell plenty yeah. of reformers um, club Pilates uh, etc but what I'm hearing is the majority are the smaller Pilates uh, reformer setups, and I'm just wondering why it, why it has been such a slow shift. Whereas what we're seeing in Australia is really we've seen the rise of group Pilates. What last 15, 15 years? It's kind of definitely in the last yeah. ten. It's been pumping. We open, we open, breathe while being in Melbourne CBD with eighteen reformers in March two thousand and seven. Um. And before that, I taught at the Elixir Health Club in Sydney where we had That's 20 right. reformers. That was from 2004 to 2006. And uh, KX Pilates opened in Australia in 2010. And they, they stay had 10 reformers to start with, but then they subsequently changed to, to 12, then 14. So Elixir, Elixir had 20 from the get-go? Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. That's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. And they, they've they've got they had three clubs in Sydney. One of them they've subsequently closed. Now I think they've got two in Sydney, and they sort of a spin off in Melbourne called Kaya Health Clubs in South Yarra. Cool. There you do okay. go. <laughs> so you're still thinking about cool. it. It's still. <laughs> I think it's I think it's time for a change. And we and I mean also we validated of course that you know if if you want to only have five reformers and only forever teach five people, fine. But there is only a finite amount of money you're going to make as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, so. and I think if you're doing that because you want to maximise the impact you have on people, I think that's back to front. You can have more impact on people when there's more people <laughs> to have an impact on. And just because you're, 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 you've got more people in the room doesn't mean you're having less impact on each person. Like, I mean, if you're listening to this, I mean, Chloe, you know, you know just as well as I do, we receive, you know, multiple DMs per day on social media from people and literally saying, you know, you guys have changed the way I teach, the way I live my life, the way I think about, you know, bodies and movement, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you. And and thank you, everybody, to, for sending us those DMs. And I always, res, always respond when I receive one because that makes my heart sing when I hear that. But like, you know, if we're able to 
to facilitate a change for people like that, people who we've never met. You know, people are at, we have 1,500 downloads per episode within the first 24 hours after each episode is released. So you're in a class of 1,500 people, right? And you can still have that effect, right? So I think going from five to 10 or even 15 reformers is not going to meaningfully dilute your impact. It's only going to magnify your impact. Yep, absolutely. Wow. And thanks so much for your DMs. Fuck, that's awesome, receiving those DMs. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely a fan, definitely a fan. Um, so, okay, Raph, well, what are we going to talk about today? Well, you know what, Chloe? I, before we go any further, I'd like, to, I'd like to do some gratefuls. Okay. Is, is that okay with you? Yeah, of course. Well, just because, you know, I feel like that's something that's really important to me in my life and um, we've got a teenage daughter at the moment and um, every time we go to do gratefuls at the table with her, she kind of rolls her eyes and mumbles and then just says, dinner. It's like, oh, what are you grateful for? Dinner. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dinner so and black eyeliner. Shine off it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to do to do a grateful here, um, you know, with you. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to start out by saying I'm really grateful to be here with you, Chloe, because, you know, we don't get as much time you know, hanging out as we used to because you used to report to me, you know, in your job role. And so we used to talk a lot, you know, like pretty much daily about stuff. And, uh, you know, time's moved on and we're both in different roles now and that's no longer the case. We still work together but not not directly so much. And I, I really value this time that we have together. And even though it's kind of like we're living our life in public and <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of our private time. <laughs> it's all on air. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm grateful for this time that I get to spend with you. Oh, thanks, Ralph. That's really nice. <laughs> I'm grateful for it too. I actually, I miss, I miss the amount of one-on-one contact I used to have with you. To be really honest, <laughs> it was always a bit of a, yeah, it was always a treat. Um, what am I grateful for? I'm just really grateful. I'm grateful to live in, you know, a great house um I, I think I think if I was uh, I think being locked down if I was locked down in that tiny little shoe box I lived in in Paddington plus working oh God, in it we, plus all yeah. it I it would just have been really a very different experience for me than what I'm going through right now so I'm immensely grateful for for space I'm uh, grateful for lovely neighbors through each wall who look out for me, who bring my bins in as part of bringing their bins in, who, you know, check in on me, who just really lovely community. And um, I'm grateful for my kittens. Let's talk about squats. Yeah, let's talk about squats. Squats, uh, S-Q-U-A-T-Z, is that what we're talking about? <laughs> I think it's S-K-W-A-T-Z. S-K-W-A-T-Z. <laughs> Well, look, it's open to, you know, really, we can, we can spell that however we want. Um, yeah. Is that what we're talking about? You know, you suggested that topic a little while back and I think it's a good topic. We haven't covered it. Yeah, I would like to cover it and the reason being is that it, it it's absolutely is still a, an elephant in the room that there is a, and I think lunges sort of fall into that potentially too if we're talking about knees, but I can, you know, because I guess the lunge is kind of just like a single leg squat kind of sort of. Yeah, right, Raph? Yeah. So we're going to put them yeah. in together. But I still see it on uh, – I still see it a lot. Maybe not so much on the daily because I am quite um, – what's the – curate? Oh, this is the word. I'm quite curated with my, mm. with my news feed now, with my Instagram feed, because I don't want to look at your page if it's got a big fucking red cross and then a big green tick because there's a certain way to do something and not. I'm, you, you've, you've lost me. Yeah. So, uh, But where I do see it still creeping in is if I do happen upon, uh, you know, often I get flagged on to go and check a page by our grads like, oh, this doesn't seem right. Does this seem right to you, Chloe? Can you go look and have a little look or, you know, just see, you know, 
maybe I'm on um, the awesome Adam Meekins uh, page as sports physio and he's been copying a lot of grief recently because of his recent back injury uh, where he was deadlifting and the the amount of grief he's copped over form and it's like that whole, you know, well, you were always going to get injured. You you were just – it was just a matter of time, mate, because of your, because of your form, you know. How do you, how did you expect not to get injured? We're just surprised it didn't happen earlier. Appalling stuff, just really, mm. really appalling. And I thought, okay, this is still really prevalent Stay out there yeah. in the movement world. And we know that uh, a lot of the Pilates realm takes from that kind of old school science of like the 90s and early 2000s and the and the alignment protocol and they just can't seem to fucking shake it and it you know sorry I'm really going on one now <laughs> I'm going it's on okay. a better Get stuff coming yeah. off at the pass but it's that whole like <laughs> I really got issues with alignment protocol Raph can you tell um, and then, you know, with Cody introducing me to Cody Jussell, introducing me to, I am adaptive and the work she's been doing with adaptive athletes. And you're just like, fuck off with your, you know, the knees got to be in a certain position and the da, da, da. So I really want to yeah, go down, <laughs> go down this. And if we've got some listeners out there that are still thinking, you know, they need to be fearful or mindful with their clients in certain positions, whether that's in regards to their back uh, or their knees in a squat or a lunge, well, let's empower them with, well, what does the evidence tell us so that they can be informed and they can feel confident to let that go. And I think part of being informed with the evidence as well uh, is helping you to know how to talk about it also so you can also help inform your clients. What do you reckon? Mm. I reckon 100%. And I think um, actually, you know, in all of in all of rehab, the, and, and I think, you know, actually taking away the, the post-surgical Yes. Component, you know, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But but if we're talking about you know the the vast majority of people we see in Pilates who have aches or pains, it, they fall under the chronic pain, you know, umbrella, persistent pain, whatever you want to call it. And and for those people, the guideline is unambivalent. It's reassurance and advice to stay active is is the the guideline recommendation. And you know the the. the I'm firmly convinced at this point that the the most powerful way that we can reassure someone is to ourself be unconcerned about their safety. You know, like n- not because we don't care about them, but because we care about them deeply, but we just don't believe there's any danger. Like we just in our gut, in our spleen, know viscerally that it's utterly perfectly safe. And when you when you have that attitude it just automatically, you can't help but communicate that in subtle and not so subtle ways to the clients. Like you don't have to just like strategize about how to communicate. If like, if you're utterly fearless and very caring, you know, that, that belief, you know, is much easier to transfer. So I think, you know, the most empowering thing we as practitioners can do for our clients is to actually become fearless ourselves, like genuinely utterly unafraid, fearless. And if you can, you know, if you can do that, all the rest is, you know, icing, I reckon. So that's what we're going to try and help you help you do. Mm. Bit of Louis Gifford, fearless, thoughtless yeah. movement. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I remember when I did a, I, I did Peter O'Sullivan's course, I've done it three or four times, I think we we went together one time, I believe. No, I didn't get I missed tickets to Pete. Uh what did we I, who, I where did we go together? Didn't we go to didn't we go to one no, of those ones been, together sometime? No, we've been to some of the same courses. So we've been to Greg Layman's but separately. Uh-huh. We've uh-huh. both been to Ben's but separately. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. You haven't been to Adam's, have I, you? I thought, but I have. I, I th- yeah, no, I've missed I, out on Pete, which is that, devastating to me. I had a, I had oh. a memory that you and I went to 
Peter Ace Olivens course together must have just be a false memory that I made. No, up. I think it was Nicole. You went with you went with Nicole. <laughs> Nicole and Heath, I think, um, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, so one one of the times when I was at Peter Ace Olivens course, you know, he he was, and this was five years ago or more now, and he was advocating. You know, it's perfectly safe to lift, lift heavy things with a flexed spine, and I was like shocked. And you know, <laughs> uh, by was that. this just and when you were kind of on the cut? Like, was this when you were yeah. transitioning into your into your fearless, thoughtless movement yeah, phase? Yeah, 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 yeah. And 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 I was like, okay, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and he was like, no, I just genuinely have zero concern. I'm, this is not, I'm not, you know, like you can go and pick up that 300 kilo barbell with a fully flexed spine. I don't care. Can you, you, hey, Raph, I'm thinking there might be some of our listeners who have no clue who Pete O'Sullivan is. I think it's worth saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, his proper title is Professor Peter O'Sullivan, and he is a uh, physiotherapist, a PhD physiotherapist, and a researcher in. So he's he's a lecturer in actual of all things manual and manipulative therapy at Curtin University in Western Australia, and he's a researcher into back pain. And he's, I'd say it's you know pretty fair to say that he is one of the, you know, most preeminent back pain researchers in the world and that, you know, anybody in the in the back research world would, you know, would agree with that statement. Um, there'd probably be some contention about whether he's the most eminent, but he's definitely in the top 10, you know, like he's very, he's a very highly credentialed researcher. He's done some really groundbreaking research, um, on the application of what's called the biopsychosocial model to helping people with disabling and persistent low back pain. So, um, and and we're lucky enough, he's New Zealand born, but we're lucky enough that he lives in Australia here and that, you know, it's amazing, you know, when we could still leave our front doors and fly around the country that you could just fly out, you know, I've seen him in Brisbane, I've seen him in Tasmania or Newcastle or somewhere, I can't remember where I've seen him, but you can just go and, and, and learn for a, a two or three days from literally one of the absolute world experts on this topic for a few hundred dollars. It blows my mind that you can you know, do that. But uh, So I've just taken every advantage until I basically could, you know, knew his lecture slides verbatim. Um, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking of doing Greg Layman's again just because I love Greg so much. <laughs> I'm thinking he's of doing the course. He's got some good YouTube clips. Yeah, he's got yeah. he's killing it on YouTube. Yeah, okay. So, um, so you went to you went to Pete's course the first time, and his concept of truly fearless movement and his deep yeah. belief in it blew your yeah. mind. Yeah, like you know, well, you found it a bit confronting. Yeah, well, he said like I think it's perfectly safe to flex, and I was like, oh yeah, you know, I agree with you, kind of like mostly, you know. And, and he was like, no, no, like I really am totally fine with it. You know, like I'm, I'm totally comfortable. If you come in and say, I've got five disc bulges, can I pick up this hundred kilo thing with a flex back? He'd be like, yeah, go for it. You know? I love that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's do but, it. But Let's God put an forbid, on there. <laughs> but God forbid you don't maintain a neutral pelvis when you're doing footwork on the reformer, Raph. <laughs> there's, there's sarcasm yeah. in that. <laughs> Anyway, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so I think that, you know, that was really, I, I learned a lot in that. That was a kind of a teachable moment for me. And I don't know whether that was his intention or not, but, um, you know, what I took from that is like, first, you know, it, as practitioners, we've got to look at our own attitudes. And, and subsequently, I've read a bunch of research that says that even when physiotherapists, for example, you know, say that oh no you know lifting any way is okay or whatever it's like then you actually look at the way that they lift themselves and they you know they do it with a perfectly straight back you know and then that is communicated to their clients because when they when they go and pick their clients flex band off the floor they do it with a perfectly straight back you know and the client picks up those nonverbal signals so yeah anyway so um Let's talk about squats, shall we? Yeah, let's talk about squats. What are, what are some of the elephants? 
So I think some of the, the three of the key ele- uh, elements, key elephants I can think of off the top of my head would be you need to maintain a neutral spine. Air quotes. That's a red X next to that. Yeah. There's a there's a X next to well there's a there's a red. I see what you're doing there. Um, <laughs> Uh, that your knees shouldn't travel, they shouldn't go past your toes, but they should also travel in line with, isn't it like in line your, with second, your second toe? With your yeah, second definitely. toe. Um, air that, quotes. There's a red quotes, X of that as well. Yeah. That, yeah, this is not a quotable quote. Um, and <laughs> knee valgus is a big no no. Yeah, so knees, knees should stay out, not in. So those, I think they're the key. And I think. Uh, the knee stuff you would um, apply to lunges as well, uh, but when I'm thinking about the 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 neutral versus flex spine, I'm thinking about more the loaded squat. Yeah. Yeah. What do you reckon? Can you think of any more? I think there's. Oh, what about? Is there anything to do? Oh, you know where I do hear a lot of um, corrections when I see some of, and again. I, if I see this stuff coming up, I just unfollow because I don't have the energy for it in my life at the moment. Um, but the whole – that your your feet – you know, if you're doing a squat, you we all should be in this – you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a right amount of turnout and there's a right yeah, stance. Yeah, there's a correct foot position. And it's feet got should be a certain distance, sweet yeah. fuck yeah. all to do with the actual morphology of the bones in your pelvis. Yeah. It's like – it's like no – we are yeah. all cookie cutter and if you're doing it any different to that, well, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Nice use of the word morphology in a sentence, by the thank, way. Thank you very much, Raf. Yeah. Yes. Sometimes I get it. Sometimes um, I get it right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the myth is – and I've heard various – like versions of what the correct foot position is, like it's hip distance apart. It's a bit wider than hip distance yeah. apart. It's parallel. It's slightly turned out. It's, you know, yeah. whatever it is. But but the notion that there is a correct yes. foot position yes. is an, a, massive, an ele- a massive elephant. Yes. yes. Wow. Okay. Which one should we start with? This is juicy. <laughs> All right. Well, let's start with that one. Okay. Cool. Foot position. Yeah. I love that. I love, I love this one. And I actually think – no, no, I don't think – you were the one that busted this one for me years ago now, and I'm pretty sure you did it by – I wonder if you showed us different pelvises, different bone structures, yeah. bony structures. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, the, and, and I actually got this from, don't get triggered, Stu McGill. <laughs> Why would you do this to me, Ralph? <laughs> <laughs> well, because credit where credit's due, and you know, I disagree with him as do you on a bunch of things, but I think also, you know, he's he's a smart guy, and he, I think in this, I agree with what he's what he's saying. Um, mm. So, can I just jump in for a second? So, I get it; he's done a lot of research, but he's also I'm also putting him in the dinosaur category firmly when he tells clients that they deserve their pain, quote unquote. Absolutely, yeah. 100%. So I'm like, I'm really sort of conflicted. <laughs> As I think are a lot of the, <laughs> a lot of the uh, rehab realm. Yeah, well, I guess you know my position is uh, I try not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, and I, you know, I, I strongly disagree with the stance that he takes on back pain. Mm. But uh, I don't think that makes him wrong on everything. It right. just, you know, I try and take it on a case by case basis. Um, uh, so yeah, so. Well, not only do people's are people's pelvises different widths, you know, like different people have different widths width of their bones, but also the 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 way that the acetabulum, acetabulum the hip socket faces, is variable. Like, I mean, fucking literally everything about humans is variable, right? Think of a thing right. if it's got anything to do with humans. It's variable. <laughs> Even identical um, twins have things that are different. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and and so if you, if you get, you know, two different humans and X-ray them or MRI them or whatever or get cadavers and look at their pelvic bones, what you'll see is the hip sockets face more forwards on some people and more sideways on other people. Yep. You know, so 
and, and there's, you know, obvious, there's, there's some range of, you know, normal, you know, that, you know, 90% of the population fall within a certain range. Okay. And I don't know how many degrees of variance that is, but it, it's, it's several degrees, right? And, you know, Stu McGill's theory is this, this falls along kind of ethnic or racial lines, like maybe Asian people, you know, they're, ace tabulums face more forwards and uh, Celtic people, their ace tabulums face more sideways and stuff. I haven't seen any research on that, but it sounds kind of plausible to me. Um, but, you know, basically, you know, I've I've seen, and I'll, I'll put a link to um, his presentation where, you, you know, you can see the, it's just like different pelvises with ace tabulums that face more forward or more sideways. And so if you're someone whose ace tabulum faces more forward, well, your kind of midpoint of hip abduction, adduction, right, is going to be with your knees and feet closer together, yeah. right, a more narrow stance, right? Whereas if you're someone whose acetabulums face more outwards, your sort of midpoint of your hip socket is going to be with your knees and feet facing more outwards, right? Mm -hmm. So so this idea of your feet should be hip distance apart is just – it it doesn't fit with what we know about human anatomy. And and that extends even beyond the acetabulums, right? So not only will not only the acetabulums face more outwards on some people, more forwards than other people, on some people they face more downwards. And on other people they face more upwards. Right. Right. So the vertical alignment is different as well. And so if you're someone who, you know, some people the sockets are deeper. Other people, the sockets are shallower. So if you're someone with really deep sockets, you're not going to get into as deep a hip flexion before the, the bones kind of touch each other, right? Whereas if you've got shallower hip sockets, then you've got more range of motion. And we see the extreme example of that is the shoulder, which has got a very shallow socket and we've got a lot of range of motion. You know, there's few people that can't do the splits with their arms, right? But almost everyone can't do the splits with their legs, even though it's a ball and socket joint just the same as the shoulder. It's because the shoulder's got yeah. a lot shallower socket, right? Mm -hmm. So if you just happen to be somebody who, you know, within the range of normal has slightly shallower hip sockets, right, well, it's going to be easier for you to go deeper into a squat, you know, with without discomfort, right? And, with your, and if your sockets face more forwards, you know, you'll, you'll do, be able to do that with your knees and feet more narrow, you know, whereas if you if you've got deep hip sockets that face outwards, you're going to have to use a lot of turnout, and you probably will never get ass to grass squat, no matter what foot position you have. Yeah. So yeah, so I think that's you know to me that's like a that's a total. I mean, to me, that's kind of an incontrovertible thing. Having actually seen pelvises that are different shapes, yep. it, it's inconceivable to me that we should all squat with our feet in the same position. Yes, and I could not agree more. And since learning – because I'm sure – Back earlier in my career, I would have been the feet, hip distance apart, you know, and then whatever whatever alignment protocol I decided was the, you know, maybe it was slightly turned out and that's where everyone was to squat. And you'd look around and inevitably you'd see there would be people that would be really struggling in that position. Some people would be comfortable in that position. Some people would be getting asked grass. Some people would be quite restricted in that position. And... Um, it just makes so much sense now knowing this. So how I apply this knowledge in a group setting, whether it be in reformer or whether it be on the mat, is I empower my clients to find the squat position that suits them best. I actually say have a play around with it. Maybe try having, you know, facing more forward. Face, just try some different variables and see for you what feels most comfortable and in what position do you feel like you can actually maximize your range? So I actually make that um, part of the class and part of that sort of just discovering where they might like to be individually for their for their squat. So that's that's how I've implemented. I think it's great because then you empower people to explore and to find their own, you know, line yeah. of best fit, what, it, what they like. It's, we know from a motor learning perspective that collaboration uh, helps with self-efficacy. So uh, this is that is a way to collaborate as well. And, yeah, my clients really loved it. And because you do get the client that will say, but should I wh – where, where should my feet be? Where should I – you know, they want to know. We, we know this, Raph. 
Uh, a lot of the time they want to know, am I doing it right? So by saying, hey, we're going to make this and, – and the reason being that we're all going to have a different position that's going to work more, most optimally for us, you're still addressing that for them. You're not just ignoring it. And, mm. yeah, so I, I have found that's been really effective. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah. That, yeah. I mean, that's pretty much the way I, I used to do it as well. Um, yeah, so all right. So I think the the whole, you know – put your foot, your feet a certain distance apart thing. It's like, all right, well, if you're teaching a class and you say everyone have your feet hip distance apart, that's not going to kill anyone. You know, everyone will be fine, yeah. <laughs> right, if you do that. But it's like, why? Yeah. You know, what, what are you adding that extra layer of rules for? It's not mm. achieving anything apart from could making we literally, some people uncomfortable. <laughs> right. So could we literally just instead say, hey, everyone, let's come into a squat. Let's go. Right. And not even <laughs> and mention people what just to do just, with your feet. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And people will just naturally go into a right. squat. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, what if I've got the client then that goes, uh, actually, my knee's hurting when I do that? I'm just playing devil's advocate here, Raf. <laughs> you went really blank. I know what to – like, what, you know, what – because we can imagine that that's a lot of our cli- – a lot of our listeners will have clients yeah. who will then say something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, my approach would be if someone has knee pain, the first thing I would do would be like, oh, well, if, you know, do you reckon you can put up with it for another 10 reps while we finish? And if they were like, yeah, I reckon I can hack it, I'd be like, okay, great. High five you. Let's keep going. Say no more about it. You know, I'd never mention it again <laughs> unless they brought it up. Yeah. Um, where, whereas if they were like really worried and really concerned about it and they were like, yeah, I'm not sure I want to put up with this sort of thing, I'd be like, all right. I look at their feet. If their feet are really turned out, I say, why don't you bring your feet a bit closer together? Or if their feet are really turned in, I might say, oh, why don't you turn your feet a bit out a bit? Not because we're changing any particular biomechanical thing, but just because sometimes if you're a bit sensitive in a certain position, if you just change the position a bit for reasons unknown, the pain goes away, right? Uh-huh. So it'll just be changed something. It doesn't really matter what you change, but if you just change something, sometimes the nervous system goes, oh, I don't need to worry about that anymore. So, yeah, and then they go, oh, how did you know that turning my feet in a bit would help? And I'd be like, oh, it's just my extensive knowledge of biomechanics and, you know, <laughs> blah, blah. No, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I would just say sometimes changing changing something. Just Raph just saw me getting triggered again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How yeah, would you no, approach he it, would, No, you know, I'd, you be, I'd be pretty much – No, I'd pretty much do the same thing yeah. as you. So step one, I don't fear my client's pain. Um, you know, the pain is not to be some discomfort when exercising is, is pretty normal. And particularly if you've got something that already kind of sort of hurts and then you're going to exercise, well, it's really normal that that thing will kind of sort of hurt when you're exercising. And there are multiple (laughs) studies that actually say that, uh, some pain during exercise is actually the opposite of being bad. It can actually be advantageous at point isn't there a yeah. study that says yeah, in yeah. the short in the short term yeah in the short term um so you know i'm not going to fear my clients pain and and i will usually just ask is it tolerable can you yeah can you do some more if it's intolerable then we'll just try and change up the sensation a little by changing up the position maybe i'll reduce the you know say to them maybe just don't go so deep like reduce the ROM a little bit as well. I also, Raf, talk a yeah. lot um, to my clients, it, particularly in a group setting, and I tend to weave these narratives in as they're moving. So I sort of walk around and I just add in a little bit of depth here and there and mainly as a way to – and this is more probably with my newer clients – to kind of let them know I do know, you know, and I think that can help build trust and therapeutic alliance. So I do talk about how advantageous it is to move the joints through full range. And in fact, that's actually what the joints need in order to be hydrated. So I get that when something hurts, you can be reluctant to want to move deeper through that, you know, move further through that range. So we're going to build you up bit by bit. We're going to incrementally increase your range of movement. We're not going to fear that movement. And in fact, it's going to be the best thing possible we can do for your knee joint if that's what that's what hurting so I actually loop that in as part of my narrative and that's been very effective I want you to be my Pilates teacher yeah thanks I'm pretty great (laughs) 
<laughs> I do love teaching a Pilates class. It definitely is my flow state. I'm not going to lie. But there's so many ways that you can you can build in this knowledge within the class setting so that your clients feel safe with you, I guess, is a way to safe. They feel safe to move fearlessly. Is that a is that does that sound right? Is that an oxymoron? I don't know. You know, they feel I and know. I think the Sounds word I think it. by safety I mean trusting. Because if you're going to ask yeah. someone to move through something that hurts or move into a position that the the narrative for them has been that this is actually a dangerous position to be in or this is a position that's going to either cause pain or lead to pain, well, they need to know they can trust you when you're like Yeah. You know, no, actually fearless movements are yeah. the way forward. Yeah, I think because, you know, Pete O'Sullivan, we see all this, you see these, the great things Pete, you know, Pete doesn't tolerate uh, pain behaviour. So the, the patient walks, the patient walks on hobbling and he gets them to sort of stop that straight away, doesn't he? Stop limping, yeah. Stop limping. But he can, he can do all these things because he does have, you know, I mean, he's Professor Pete O'Sullivan. He comes with such, uh, there's that ultimate trust in him already because of, who he is and what he does, right? But uh, uh, yeah, no? possibly. But also, I've seen him like he's just really good at building therapeutic alliance. And I think there'd be plenty of people who would see him who aren't part of the back pain literature world and or academia or whatever. And and so don't really, you know, I mean, they might know that all right, he's twice as expensive as the average physiotherapist. So you know, and he's been ref- I've been referred to him or whatever. So he probably does get some additional credibility there, but. I just think he's, you know, it's well-deserved credibility because he's just really good at building therapeutic alliance and listening to the person and validating their experience but not tolerating the, their pain behaviours. Mm. Yeah. All right, so let's – let's. all right, so we've, we've, we've got rid of the – everyone's feature in a certain way. Yes. <laughs> Thank God. So let's, Thank let's, God. Can that myth now die? Up. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's work our way up and talk about knees. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. All right, so there are a couple that you said. One is knees should stay behind toes. And knees should the stay other behind one is that toes. they should be in line with the second toe. Or in other words, the knees shouldn't go in, basically. Yeah. You know. And knee valgus is a no-no. Mm. So knees so going in. So knee valgus is, yeah, when, you, when you're going into your squat, either going in or, or coming up. And, yeah. and your knees dip inwards. And if you've watched anyone yeah. lifting any sort of heavy power lifting, there's almost always a knee valgus moment. Am I correct in saying that, Raf? Yeah. Um, in fact, this is something I, I think I've thought about quite a bit and I've been inspired by some ideas from Greg Lehman. Uh, and I've just I've also just done a bunch of reading uh, myself. So the firstly is 100% Chloe. If you just, you know, if, you, if you're listening to this, Go to YouTube and type in, you know, Olympic weightlifting gold medal, right? Any weight category, any year, any gender, like just go and look. And if you look, I I guarantee if you look at five lifters, you will see at least one who has significant knee valgus, you know, knees going in as they stand up from the deep squat, right? Um, And I'm going to link in the show notes to uh, my personal favourite, because he's an Australian, Dean Lucan, um, winning the gold medal at the 1982 Commonwealth Games in the heavyweight weightlifting category. I can't remember exactly how much he lifted. It was like 200 and something kilos um, and, you know, really fucking heavy. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Um, And and just like You wouldn't be far off that, would you? Uh, Yeah, I can deadlift. 240 odd, but right. that is just pick it up off the ground to waist height. So he's, he's pressing it, it above overhead, his head. Right, overhead. Okay. 200 <laughs> that's, kg that's, overhead. Yeah, yeah. The current world record, Lasha Talahadze holds it, is for a snatch, which is lifting it directly from the ground to overhead. So not resting it on your shoulders first, but just straight from the ground to overhead is 225 kilos. It's just crazy. Wow. It's insane what people can do. Isn't that just um, mind blowing yeah. and inspiring? <laughs> that is just is unbelievable. And when I watched Lasha Talahadze lift that, you look at him and you think this guy's got more. Like he could do more. Two hundred and twenty five kilos, he makes it look easy. 
you know. Wow. Unbelievable. Anyway, we digress. So, okay. but if you if you just like it's it's super common amongst elite, you know, the elite of the elite Olympic weightlifters and power powerlifters as well, as they stand up from the bottom of a squat, knees go in. It's not a hundred percent of people. I don't know what percentage of people it is, but it's it's definitely significant. You know, if you look at a few, you'll definitely see one before you look at more than half a dozen. Um, and so, right, so that's not really a scientific argument, but it's just like, okay, kind of a common sense argument that if we, if we look at people like for Dean Lucan, right, to win the Commonwealth Games gold medal, like how many squats do you think you would have to do over how many decades, right, to get good enough to win the, the gold medal, you know, like freaking thousands, right? Yeah. So the man has, has lifted triple or double his body weight above his head literally thousands of times, Right from starting from a deep squat with his knees going all the way in, and there he is, happy as Larry, no knee wraps, winning the Commonwealth Games, bada bing, bada boom. Two years later, went on to win the Olympic gold. You know, so I think that speaks to the fact that you know it's 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 it can be safe to for your knees to go in in a squat, but um, there are some like really uh, and 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 all everything else I'm about to say is is sort of hypothesis or conjecture but based on the anatomy and biomechanics right so there you know we we think like okay when your knees go in in a squat oh that's because your glutes are weak or your glutes are underactive or something right i mean right. we must all have heard that right i mean sure you've like, heard that it's, isn't it meant to be like glute mead or something isn't that yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and and uh, so here's the thing there all right so we think well you know glute glute max is a hip extensor Okay, and it's an abductor, or at least the, the iliac fibers are. And then, so as you stand up from the squat, the glute max is extending the hip, so it should also be abducting the hip, right? Right. So if your hips adduct as you stand up, that must mean that your glute max is not firing properly, right? right. Or is weak, right? And your quads are dominating or something like that. Okay. Uh, well, that, you know, that's the story that I hear a lot, right? Yeah. Um, and so, well, you know, so here, here's the. Here are a couple of things that were suggested to me by Greg Lehman, which I think are totally plausible. Well, one, the glute max tensions the IT band, right? So the, the, the iliac fibers of glute max insert into the iliotibial band, right? They don't actually insert into the femur. It's only the sacral fibers that insert into the femur, right, that, that, which we're not concerned with here. So the, the iliac fibers, which is about two-thirds of the muscle bulk of the glute max, all of it inserts into the IT band, right? Which the TFL, since fascia latte, also inserts into. The IT band is a thick band of fascia that goes down the outside of the, the thigh and inserts into the kneecap and into the tibia and the fibula and the gastrocnemius and the biceps femoris. It inserts into a whole bunch of stuff. It also inserts into the side of the femur. And so the, we know from studies on runners that as you land when you run, Right, so you land on your stance leg, and your knee bends a little bit, and you store we store elastic energy in the IT band, right? So we basically stretch the IT band, we tension it, okay, and that's like an elastic band. It's literally like an elastic band. You know, as you pull on it, it stretches, it stores energy, and then when you let go, it goes sprawling and springs back to its resting length, and that's part of what propels you you know, forwards into the next step. And so we know this from biomechanical studies on runners, and so you know. It, it would be very, very surprising to me if that's not also the case in a squat, you know, that we store elastic energy in, you know, in, in a lunge, a squat, a hop, a jump, a, you know, all of those things, movements would probably be the same. And so, well, the IT band is tensioned by your knees going in because both the TFL and the glute max are abductors of the hip, right? So when you adduct the hip, you stretch both of those muscles therefore tensioning the IT band, right? So now if you've ever done heavy s squats, you know, you'll know that, you know, when you when you do squats to failure, the bit of the squat where you fail is always the same. It's like just below parallel, right? So when you squat all the way ass to grass and you bring your bum up just below knee height, that's, that's the hard bit. Right. Right? And that's called the sticking spot, right? Because that's where if you're going to fail in the lift, that's where you fail. Right right? You just can't get out of that bottom part of the squat. And so, well, what would happen? What would, you know, what would it, what if 
as we're coming out of the bottom of the squat, what we actually do is we bring our knees in and that tensions the ITB and stores elastic energy, which we then release as we bring our knees out again as we come up through the sticking spot, thus giving us a little bit of, you know, a little bit of a boost through that sticking spot, you know, from the elastic energy that we stored in the IT band. So anyway, Greg Lemon does a great, did show me a great video, which I, I don't have access to, of basically a cadaver um, showing, you know, basically when you push on the knee into valgus, it stretches the IT band and then the, the knee spr yo 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 springs back out again, you know, really awesome. So anyway, so that's theory number one, is that we're tensioning the IT band. The second thing is, well, glute max is an abductor, right, or the iliac vibes are. So... If we adduct it, it, we could be pre-tensioning the muscle, right? Right. So just like when you go to throw something, you know, you automatically bring your arm backwards first, yeah. right? Yeah. To pre-tension the muscle. Or if you go to jump up as high as you can, you automatically go down a go bit down first. Go down first, yeah. Right? Right? Well, if we want to get maximum power out of our glute max, we might adduct a little first to mm. pre-stretch the muscle fibers to get more power to go through that sticking spot. So that's mm. theory number two. Theory number three, and this came from a paper. Um, which I'm just looking at now. Um, I think this. I think this is the one, and I'll, I'll double check my. Uh, I. I, I I haven't got it in. I've got it in front of me. I've got so many papers open. I can't tell you which one it is though. But I'll, I'll find it and I'll put it in the show notes. Basically, that what they they did this kinematic analysis of the squat. So just they, they analyzed, analyzed the movement of the squat and looked at the modelling of what the muscles do in the you know throughout the range. And what they found is that glute max is an external rotator, and you know most of us know that. Okay, but. When you get into very deep hip flexion, the action of glute max on rotation actually reverses. It becomes an internal rotator. And I, you know, without having a, a, a model f to explain that, I'd, I can't explain that any better than just saying, it's like, you're going to have to take my word for it. And I'm going to post the paper here that you can read in the show notes if you want. But you know, this is pretty common for many muscles in the body. Their action changes depending on the joint angle, right? Right. So when we say muscle X is an abductor or an adductor or an internal external rotator or whatever, it's like, yeah, if you start from neutral, it's an abductor. But if you start from ab extension, it might be an adductor or whatever. It's like it's, it depends where you start from. Um, and so glute max is, you know, is case in point. When you get into deep hip flexion, actually the iliac fibers flip from being an external rotator to being an internal rotator. And maybe I'll make a video on that one day, but that's for another time. And so, well, when you're in deep hip flexion, when you activate your glute max, it internally rotates your thighs, mm. right? So knees going in in the bottom of the squat could be just that's the action of glute max in that position. Mm. That's cool. theory number three. Theory, mm. oh, theory number four. There's four. As you, I did more than four. Oh, there's more. Than, there's more. Oh, my God. <laughs> as, as you go deeper into a squat, right, yeah. as you go deeper into hip flexion, right, and we just talked about the action of muscles – changing as joint angle changes, right? So in, and, and this is case in point, you know, so in uh, the adductor magnus, your largest adductor, okay, uh, we call it an adductor, which it is. It's also a powerful hip extensor, right, like glute max and hamstrings, but only when the hip is in flexion. Right? So when the hip's in neutral, adductor magnus is not a hip extensor. Mm. It's just an adductor. So I'm thinking like uh, if I'm doing like a leg press and I'm yeah. on my back and knees are, you know, like like hips yeah. are flexed. Yeah. And as I'm yeah. gonna press or that even, and as I'm gonna press the press the plates away, that's when it's gonna do its thing. Right. Or even when you're in a really deep lunge. I mean, you know, right. many of you listening to this will have had the experience of doing deep lunges, right, in Pilates class one time, and then the next day your inner thighs feel a bit sore. Well, after I, I've told you before, the the most common DOMS, and we know I'm no longer a DOMS seeker, <laughs> but um, the most common DOMS I've had after leg press are inner thigh soreness. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, adductor soreness. Well, that's because, it, that's because adductor magnus, like it changes its function 
it changes its action as the hip moves, right? So when the hip's in neutral, adductor magnus is an adductor, right? When the hip's in flexion, it becomes a hip extensor. So it pulls the hip back to that neutral adducted position, right? So if a hip starts from flexion, it'll pull it back in, you know, extend it back to neutral, right? And so the, and be, just because of the the way that it's arranged on the pubic ramus and, and you know, where the insertion is on the, on the femur, the more you get into hip flexion, so the more you flex the hip, the more powerful adductor magnus becomes as a hip extensor, right? Until right at the bottom of a squat where you're new, or at the bottom of a leg press or the bottom of a deep lunge, okay, when you're in maximal hip flexion, okay, like your, your, your thigh is nearly on your belly, okay, adductor magnus is probably the most powerful hip extensor. It's more powerful than glute max at that angle, at that specific angle. Um, and so, as you rise from the bottom of the squat, where your knees, where your hips are maximally flex, the most powerful hip extensor is a ductor magnus, right? So, what if your knees going in is just because your adductor magnus is fucking awesome, right? And it's just extending the shit out of your hips, right? And at the same time, because it can't help it, it's so strong, right? It also adducts your hips because it's right. an adductor, yeah. right? And then as you get a bit further up, adductor magnus becomes a weaker and weaker hip extensor and glute max kicks in, right? And then your hips abduct, right? And your knees come out again. Yep. So that's theory number four. Okay. Are we going to yeah. get going? Are there some good theories? There's some good, th- you know, we, I've got we'll a couple more, but, I, you know, oh, that's, let's park it at four, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> but I guess, you know, you know, take, you know, take home, all right, we've got this theory that, you know, glutes and abductor, if your knees go in, that's bad because it means you're losing your glutes. Like, well, does it? Is it? Could it could there be other explanations? Yeah. Do we have any evidence for any of these? No. Including the one that your glutes are inact- inactive. Um, in fact, there's a couple of studies which I'll link to showing that there's no relationship between glute strength glute activation and knee valgus in a squat. So, you know, why do people's knees go in? Huh. Bonus theory number five. We all have, you know, different le- ratios of length of your femur, your thigh bone to your tibia, your shin bone, right? You know, some people have slightly longer tibias relative to their femurs and other people vice versa, right? And you've, I'm sure you've noticed this if you've walked ever, you know, seen humans, that some people have longer torsos in relation to their legs and other people have longer legs in relation to their torsos, right? Now, if in a squat, you've got to keep your center of mass over your feet. You know, your center of mass is, depending on your body dimensions, whatever, it's roughly around your belly button-ish, you know, give or take a bit. And so if you've got longer femurs, right, well, you've got a, your bum's going to go further backwards because your femurs are longer, right, which means you're going to fall over backwards unless you hinge your torso forwards, <laughs> right, which makes it harder work, right? But there's if you, if you bring your knees together, right, in the front to back direction, that actually shortens mm. your femurs. You know, if you're looking from the side, right, and I'm doing a squat with my knees, you know, with my, my thighs parallel to the floor, and I bring my knees in together, you're going to see my knees come back closer towards my body, Right, I become foreshortened. So knees going in might. Another explanation is it might be uh, just a, a a like a an adaptation to maintain a, the continuous center of mass of your body over your feet for people who have relatively longer femurs compared to their tibia or their torso. Anyway, sorry, I said I'd stop at four, but I'll definitely stop at five. <laughs> You've now. lost me. I I I know. I, I yeah yeah. It's cool. It's it's all very interesting. Oh, okay, so this, this this stuff really needs video to to explain it. I'm sorry about that. Um. Okay. But suffice it to say that there are plenty of alternate explanations that equally fit the facts as we know them, that don't have to include your glutes being weak. You know, for your knees to go in. Okay, so Ralph, is there any time that knee valgus is dangerous or there is an indicator of if someone has greater knee valgus in a squat, then 
yada yada? Or no? Uh, well, there is some literature on knee valgus, knees going in and ACL rupture. That's risk. that's where, what I was sort of thinking. Yeah, and that's usually been looked at in not in squats but in drop jumps where basically people stand up on something uh, like it's a couple of feet right. off the floor and then they drop down. And what they've actually found um, in a recent systematic review from uh, 2020 – called Do Knee Abduction Kinematics and Kinetics Predict Future Anterior Cruciate Ligament Injury Risk a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of Prospective Studies? Um, the short answer is no, they don't. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So that's yeah. great. That's updated my knowledge on that. And also I think I did see that. Who's the Aussie guy that does a heap of work with ACL? Um, Hughes, uh, Hughes, Mick Hughes, yeah. Mick Hughes. Shout out to Mick Hughes. Yeah. Shout out to Mick Hughes. Yeah, he's doing amazing work. That's right. I follow his page and I follow him on Facebook as well because he puts out a lot of like great, great studies. And he put that out, yeah. didn't he? And I was like, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay, great. So we can pop the yeah. knee valgus. So what what have we put to bed now? We have put to bed. Uh, foot position, that you don't have to have your feet in a certain position uh, to do a safe squat or whatever you want to, however you want to word it. There is no optimal foot position. In fact, the optimal foot position is whatever that is for the individual whatever. human yeah. beings in front of you, right? It's yeah. for the individual. You know, we, well, we would all – like let's. We well, could we'd just all, say, don't worry about foot position and just get moving. <laughs> well, don't worry about foot position, get moving, and guess what? They, the human being will find their They'll own optimal position. Yeah. yeah, right. Okay, so let's let's stop telling people where to put their feet in a squat. Next, uh, knee valgus, the knee, knee going in during a squat, uh, whether that be on the way down or the way up, doesn't matter. Leave them alone. Well, we've got, all, we we've got this story that it's bad and – and I guess the takeaway, you know, I'm sorry if I, if all of that stuff was convoluted and I you know, didn't explain it very well, but, but you know, the takeaway should be there are fuckloads of other alternate s- stories, right, that also fit the facts and don't involve any problem, right, don't involve it being yeah. a problem. Um, and also we have actual literature saying that it's not a predictor of injury risk. Awesome. Um, so, so, but just in answer to your question, like, would I ever change it? Yes, there is one situation where I would change it. If someone was squatting with knees going in a lot and also said to me, gee, this really hurts my knees, right? right? The first thing I would say would be, hey, do you reckon you could put up with it for another 10 reps, right? And if their answer was, yeah, I reckon so, I'd be like, okay, great. I'll never mention it again unless they bring it up, okay? But if they're like, nah, this is really like, distracting me it's too painful I'd be like okay why don't you try pushing your knees out a bit see if that helps right again not because knees out is better just because if you're doing it one way and it hurts sometimes if you should do it a different way any different way a bit of bit of neuromodulation yeah right just uh, just smoke and mirrors yeah um and so we still got knees going forwards and also rounding the back and I'm also I'm just a bit conscious that you know of time And I think maybe, you know, like, do we have time to do all of that? Should we kind of wrap it and make a second episode or should we plough through? What are your thoughts? Well, I think think we can plough through. I feel like in regards to the stoop versus squat lifting, that's a a quick and easy one. We can talk about the the percentage of the degree of flexion that blah, blah, blah. I mean, I – yeah, I just delivered yeah, that yeah. to the the cert crew on the weekend, I think, or the weekend before. Um, so I think let's let's get it all out there, Raf. Let's go with okay. now right. um, why this whole knees shouldn't go over toes situation. Right. Right. Well, I think if you ask if you ask most people, you know, like I'm talking about like fitness instructors, Pilates instructors, you know, why shouldn't the knees go over the toes? I reckon most people wouldn't have a coherent answer to that. I know I didn't when I used to believe that was a thing. I knew there was some kind of vague, you know, quote, danger, unquote. But I couldn't have said like, oh, well, it applies excessive loads to the posterior cruciate ligament, which is the main restraint to, you know, and posterior tibial draw in a deep squat. You know, like, 
I think, I don't know, but just remembering back what I used to know, you know, when I used to think that was dangerous, I didn't know what the PCL, the posterior cruciate ligament did. I didn't know what its breaking strain was. I didn't know how much strain it was subjected to, you know, beyond 90 degrees of knee flexion. You know, so it's like, all right, there's some notion that it's dangerous, but I don't think most people really have a coherent notion of why it's it might be dangerous. And and so the the best explanation I've heard about, you know, of why it might be dangerous, which by the way is not true, um, is that, you know, you've got two main internal ligaments inside the knee, the anterior cruciate ligament and the posterior cruciate ligament. And basically, the really easy, easy way to remember what these two ligaments do is they stop the tibia, the shin bone, from sliding in the direction of their name, right? So the anterior cruciate ligament stops the tibia sliding forwards and the posterior cruciate ligament stops the tibia sliding backwards. And in a deep squat, um, there's a lot of posterior force on the tibia from the patella, um, you know, pushing or from the yeah, from the patella and the patella tendon, pushing the tibia backwards. Um, and so there's a lot of tension on the uh, posterior cruciate ligament, you know, below when you squat deep, you know, when you, when you flex your knees, basically, any time. So it doesn't matter if you're squatting deep, but if your knees go forward of your toes, you end up flexing your knee more. So, you know, if there's more load on the posterior cruciate ligament. But the thing is, it's just this, it's this, this kind of like paradoxical thing that we have with good and bad muscles. It's like, well, if we say, oh, hey, do this this exercise because there's more load on your abs, well, that's a good thing. But if we say, don't do this exercise because there's more load on your posterior cruciate ligament, well, that's a bad thing, you know. So we have this kind of paradoxical notion of load is good in certain situations and load is bad and dangerous in other situations. And it's like, well, your fucking posterior cruciate ligament adapts like every other tissue in your body when you subject it to load it gets fucking stronger and we've got studies showing that you know when they mri or ultrasound the posterior cruciate ligaments of competitive power lifters they're fucking huge you know <laughs> like mm. they, they get stronger because of all that load that they're subjected to over time so is there I is there any truth to we should be more mindful of that if someone has had a knee reco in regards to that range? Uh, if you've just come back, all right. So you know this this I mean this conversation is not contextualised to if you're helping somebody come back from knee surgery, right? This is yeah. just in your in your group exercise class. So Raph, I'm not thinking I'm not thinking stage one. Po- I'm not thinking you know they're still in rehab post post. Mm-hmm knee reco i'm talking mm-hmm. they've had a knee reconstruction at some because i'm, I'm just saying I, i'm bringing this up because this is something that i hear quite a lot is if they have had a knee reconstruction before then you mm-hmm. need to be extra mindful of the knee not going over the toes is that just a huh. total myth well uh well I think there's a little bit of nuance to the answer to that, but not a lot of nuance to it. And, you know, so, you know, rehab can, you know, feel kind of mysterious and esoteric, but it's really simple. Rehab is nothing but the process of restoring strength, range of motion and control, right? So when you have an injury, you lose, you, you lose all of those things to some degree and rehab is just the process of restoring those, right? And so, you know, when you're rehabbing somebody's you know, PCL, right, their posterior cruciate ligament, you know, one of the, you know, uh, there's a, there's a, you know, that process of restoring strength, range of motion and control, you know, at the beginning stages of rehab, we, we protect the injured part, mm-hmm. you know, to a great extent, and we expose it to a little bit of load, a little bit of range, a little bit of, you know, variability, and then gradually over rehab, we, we apply more load, more range of motion, more variability until it, at the end of rehab, we're actually exposing it to those, you know, high risk situations that are more likely, you know, that's the mechanism of, mechanism of injury because actually the whole purpose of rehab is to develop the capacity in that tissue so it can resist those high risk situations. So if you, if you do get in that situation again, your PCL doesn't snap, right, because it's strong enough to withstand the, that load, right? So how do you get it strong enough? We have to gradually expose it to load over time, mm-hmm. you know, starting in early rehab and then gradually building it up. And and 
you know, so if somebody's been through rehab, now we know the tissue healing time on a PCL, on a ligament, you know, 18 months or so, right? So if somebody's like more than 18 months, you know, post-op, and if they've done their rehab properly, that knee should be literally as good as new, right? It should, if, if the rehab's been done properly, it's, it's, it should be 100% as strong as the non-injured knee, mm-hmm. right? Now, in many cases, I think rehab doesn't get done properly because people do their five physiotherapy sessions and then that's it. <laughs> and, and, you know, two years later, they, they still favouring that leg or whatever, in which case, yeah, I would say, yeah, for that person, you need to be a little bit, uh, a little bit gentle, but the gentle shouldn't be something that you maintain forever. You start gentle and you need to build them up to build their, because they're not going to get stronger if you never expose them to load, mm. right? I mean, if I come to your Pilates class and I say, I want to get really fucking strong abs, but I don't ever want to work my abs. Mm. It's like, well, that's not going to work. <laughs> so if you want someone's knee to get strong, you've got to load the knee, mm. right? And and if it's starting from a low base, we've well, got to start from a low base of load, right? But, you know, assuming that you're in a group exercise situation and they're out of rehab and it's something, it's an old issue, if they were rehabbed properly, it should be not an issue anymore. Great. That's, that's what rehab is. Yeah. Great. Okay, cool. So move through range, let your knees go over yeah. your toes, doesn't fucking yeah, matter. Fuck in, it. In, in, yeah. in fact, it will help you get stronger and help stronger. you increase your ROM and help uh, to hydrate those uh, lovely joints. And if you want to hear more about uh, hydrating joints, we'll listen to our uh, episode on arthritis. Mm. Yeah, and, you know, if if you – I'm just going to pop a, a link to a photo in the, in the show notes, but, I mean, look at any Olympic weightlifter at the bottom of their lift. Their knees are freaking a mile in front of their toes. Like, they're, they're literally like 10 centimetres forwards of the toes for most of them. It's like it's a totally normal part. I mean, it's not physically possible to squat ass to grass – with your knees behind your toes, you fall over backwards, mm. right? So, yeah. Yep, that's exactly right. And if we look back at some of the awesome vintage photos of uh, our mate Joe Pilates teaching, and I'm thinking here, I'm thinking Jacob's Pillow, I'm thinking there's this great image of him in a really deep squat, like super deep. I think he's got his he- heels lifted. And then he's got two uh, female clients. I think they've got the little, the the really, the cute balancing (laughs) bean bags on their head. And they're also holding the deep squat. I do some of that. Actually, yes, that's going to inspire me for tonight's masterclass. But we do some of those. And those are freaking, that's a burner when you hold it down there in those deep squats. Of course, your knees are bloody over your toes. Come on. Come on. I mean, and just, just look like if you go, you know, if you're ever like look at, I mean, just look at anybody, not in a fitness situation, right? Just in life, right? Squatting down, like old women in the markets in Thailand, right? Where are their knees? You know, workers, you know, um, in India, you know, pulling rice out of paddies or, you know, hammering nails into a roof, their knees are a mile in front of their toes. You know, Japanese people sitting waiting for the bus. Their knees are a mile in front of their – or squatting, waiting for the bus. Their knees are a mile in front of their toes, you know. I, and I think really, Raph, this this kind of alo- alignment protocol feed into the human body as fragile. Th- yeah. th- that is that. And we know, we know that we are anti-fragile and that yeah. we need progressive load, progressive yeah. movement through range of movement, et cetera, and that we will adapt uh, and thrive. So pop those alignment protocol to bed, people. Let's mm-hmm. move in, uh, move in, move on to the last and most juicy. And, I mean, we could dedicate an entire episode to this you know, so we won't go – I don't want us to go too into the weeds with this one, Raph, because I know we could, like, we could turn this into an yeah. hour, just this combo on <laughs> stoop versus squat lifting. <laughs> but And I think we have spoken about – I think we have spoken about the forces actually um, in an yeah. earlier episode when we talked about the different forces and where they go when, when you flex, etc. Yeah. So I think for me, Raph, when I think about the most helpful thing with this in regards to a squat – really comes down to the fact that even when we think we are in 
neutral in a squat. We are actually in, and I hope you can remember the numbers, Ralph, the percentage of lumbar flexion grade. That's what I would like. I think that, yeah, let's have a talk about that study. All right. So there are two studies. The first one is, um, was a study by McKean, uh, was it McKean et al? 2010. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll dig it out. And it was basically how to lift a box that's too uh, big to fit between the feet. Right. Um, and so basically what they did was they, they got people and they put motion sensors on their sacrums and on their L1 and on their T12 and, you know, put them on a force plate, which measures, you know, the force that their feet are exerting on the ground. And then they got them to pick up a box. It was quite a large box, couldn't fit between the knees. And they had two situations, one where the box had handles in the top, so they only had to kind of get their hands down to knee height. And the other one where there was no handles and they had to reach under the box, basically had their hands at the ground to pick up this kind of awkward box, which is pretty normal. Like if you've ever moved house or yes. picked up shopping or what it's like. It's totally you know. awkward. You just got to get yeah. in there and grab shit and get it done. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, and then they, they, they looked at three different, they, they, they looked at three different techniques of lifting. One was called stoop lifting. One was called squat lifting. And one was called weight lifters technique. And so stoop lifting in the biomechanics literature just means basically where you keep your knees pretty straight and you just bend your back and your hips. You know, so like if you just kind of walked into your lounge room at home and there's a, something, you notice a bit of something on the floor, a bit of old kid's toy or whatever, and you're bent to pick it up. Most of us would pick it up with our legs pretty straight and our rounding our back. If it's so we just light, basically just bend over, pick it up. Bend over, pick it up. Yeah. That's called stoop lift, lifting in the literature. And then they did what was called squat lifting, uh, which is what you described about Joseph Pilates. So basically your heels come up off the ground, you squat down, you bend your knees, not your back, you keep your back straight and as vertical as possible and knees go wide. That's called squat lifting. And then they, they had this third technique called the weight lifting technique, which is where they basically kept their feet flat on the floor with their knees wide apart and did like a, you know, a, a fitness class squat, right. you know, sort yeah. of neutral spine, knees wide apart, squatting down, keeping their torso neutral yeah. and, you know, reaching between their knees with their back straight. Uh-huh. Um, so they do these, these three techniques, and what they actually wanted to measure was the, was the forces they were producing and stuff. But but incidentally, one of the things they measured was the angle of the low back, right? And um, and I'll post a link to the study. But um, basically, what they found was that even in the weightlifting technique, which was the the least flexed position, right? When they were picking something up from knee height, they flexed the lumbar spine twenty two degrees, which is quite a fucking bit, right, considering they're, quote, in neutral, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then when they picked it up off the floor in this weightlifting technique, you know, keeping neutral spine, like this is an experiment. You've got like eight researchers watching you and going, keep neutral, <laughs> right? They bent 45 degrees of lumbar flexion. Wow. <laughs> and, and actually in this paper, there's a photo of the person you know, caught in the moment of doing this yeah. with all the sensors on them and, and all the rest of it. I've seen that photo. Yeah, and it's awesome. It's look, they look neutral, right? And that brings me to the second study, which is um, uh, Falk et al. 2021. It's called How Accurate Are Visual Assessments by Physical Therapists of Lumbopelvic Movements During the Squat uh, and Deadlift? And the answer is not fucking very. Um, <laughs> Please tell me that the paper and- says not Fucking very. <laughs> no, that's not what they said. What they found was something like, um, so they basically got a bunch of, um, these were high level experienced weightlifters and powerlifters that they were observing. Mm-hmm. And they had six different physiotherapists observing them and, and, and visually assessing their pelvic tilt, right? In the, you know, did they keep a neutral spine in this lift, right? Um, and they were, and, and what they found was that, the physiotherapist, none of the physiotherapists could detect a pelvic tilt of less than 34 degrees, right? So in other words, when their when their lumbar spine flexed up to 34 degrees, the physiotherapist couldn't tell the they, difference. They can't tell. And perfect, can't tell the difference. Right. So once it got over 34 degrees, they're like, oh, yeah, they're it looks like, like you I think it's flexing look, now. Looks yeah. like you're flexing, but in fact, yeah. the lumbar spine was already flexed. Right, even when they thought it was perfectly neutral, it was flexed up to thirty-four degrees, which is a fuckload. Funny, <laughs> funny that, Raf. Uh, that that for me 
brings in comparisons to when people think that they can assess with their eyes whether you 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 know you're anteriorly tipped or posteriorly tipped or you're yeah. you know like when they're doing the postural assessments it's it's all the same yeah, sort of thing yeah, right yeah. we just we can't we, it's not accurate our eyes it's not accurate it's not accurate our eyes are not accurate no. No. Yeah, and, and even by palpation, you know, if you're out there thinking, mm. oh, but I can palpate. Yeah, no, there's another study I haven't got in front of me now, but I'll, I'll see if I can dig it out and link to it, that experienced physiotherapists can't even agree where the freaking PSIS is. Yeah, and know. I think we talked about that study, Raf, in our uh, imposture uh, episode. Yeah. 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 So it's like, so you, number one, when you're looking at your clients, you even though you think you know, you don't know if they're neutral or not. You don't know because yeah. if you're a 20 year experienced physiotherapist and you don't know, I'm sorry, no one knows. Right? Right. And the second thing is, even when we think we're in neutral, we're bent between 20 and 45 degrees anyway. Right. <laughs> so, so we're arguing about a moot point. It's like, even when we think these people are keeping perfect neutral, oh, that's safe. No, they're fucking flexed, dude. Like, <laughs> they're flexed. Right. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And also then, I mean, we could go down, it might be going down a rabbit hole that, which I think we've we've already answered, I'm sure in an earlier episode, that whether you're flexed or whether you're trying to be more neutral in a lift, in a squat anyway, is not the determinant of whether you're going to get injured or not. Basically, it, Load capacity, so we need to build the tissue up to that load yep. incrementally. That's that's what you know is the is the, the thing that hurt, helps the most. Uh, it's yep. irrelevant whether we're building up that capacity in more of a, a rounded uh, lift or more of a straight lift, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, there is. Um, just a, like a couple of the studies I'd just like to sort of highlight just to finish up on this is that um, there's there are a couple of recent systematic reviews that come out in the last year or so looking at this at this area. And one uh, found that um, lifting with a rounded back is not associated with more back pain than lifting with a straight back. Um, and that was this, was this is not just a study of five people or whatever. This is a pretty sizable systematic review. And the other one um, found, this was 2021, Morstan et al. Um, and the title of the paper is a little bit of a giveaway. It says, <laughs> flexed lumbar spine postures are associated with greater strength and efficiency than lordotic postures during a maximal lift in pain-free individuals. Wow. It's <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So I'll link... I'll link to that as well. Um, and, you know, there's plenty more literature, but um, basically, you know, it, it, you, you, even if you think you're looking at someone, you can tell the difference if they're in neutral reflection, you can't. And even when they swear, you know, black and blue, they're in neutral, they're probably not. Um, and what's more, it doesn't matter anyway. Love it. Okay, so away with the crosses and the ticks. Please go and put your, your green tick over everything. <laughs> so so how, should, how should we teach a squat? Hey, uh, hey Raf, let's do a squat. Squat. But, but what, where should my knees go? What should my – what? Should I be neutral? Yeah, so, so it's – yeah, like, like when, when I – like when I cue squats, I mean, I don't teach Pilates these days. I teach my wife squats in the gym. Actually, she pretty much does them just by self most of the time. But, you know, every now and then, once in a blue moon, when I do cue her, my cue is like, okay, squat down. Okay, now stand up. You know, like, <laughs> and she figures Spot it on. out. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. I love it. I love it. Okay, well, hopefully everyone found that really helpful. I think that was um, that was awesome. And I hope that it just really empowers you all if you were still slightly concerned that there was, in fact, an alignment protocol in regards to a lunge or a squat and a correct, in air quotes, way to do it. Hopefully right. you feel like you've got some freedom now and your clients will also enjoy that freedom. So 
Mm. Let's get moving. And, and I, I, I guess the, I, I would just like to add one more thing, which is that, you know, sometimes it's been my experience, you know, personally and also when teaching students that when we sort of take away a lot of these stories that, that have been sort of in the water in the Pilates world for a while, it's like, oh, you know, when I teach a squat, I've got to say 17 rules about foot placement, knee placement, pelvic placement, breath, this, that and the other. And it's like all of a sudden, you know, you and I saying, oh, well, actually, no, you don't have to worry about any of that, right? Well, what can, what can happen and what happened to me a little bit, and I see it sometimes happen to students, is people kind of fall into this sort of black pit of nihilism and they're like, well, well, what the fuck am I, what's the good of me then? Like if, 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 if I, if I'm not, if I don't need to tell my clients anything about how to move, like, why are they paying me the money? Yeah, you know, well, they're what paying. What do I say? Yeah, well, uh, they're paying you to motivate them to to move. They're paying you to keep them inspired. They're paying you to get that extra rep out of them. That's what they're paying. Mm. That's what they're paying mm. you for. That's that's mm. what I mm. think, Raf. Um, that's what they're paying you for. Yeah, you know, that's what I pay an instructor for. Uh, mm. If if I I pay for them to keep me accountable to to do that class right to to yeah, go from beginning yeah. to end of the class that's you know I I the community the sense of joy the sense of it, all of these things I'm not paying to have my body be micromanaged and to mm. walk out of a class feeling like you know I've I've got all these little asymmetries and all these little things that inherently, you know, need to be fixed. Uh, I want to walk out of the class feeling like I've had a freaking great time. I've had an awesome workout. Uh, I've tried some cool shit. Uh, Maybe I've done, you know, I've pushed myself a little bit more than I expected to. And uh, I know personally that I absolutely uh, push myself more if I'm with a trainer than if yeah. I'm by myself. Yeah. So you've got so much to give to your clients that, you know, telling them that their knees should be in a certain position and this and that is is not part of that. Yeah. That's tell them I a think. joke. Tell them they're awesome. You know, like tell me, ask them if they can do another five, you know. Like yeah. that, that's what you should be saying to them. Yeah. Yeah. Empower fearless movement. Um, the the – f- the final thing I want to I want to bring up because this is again something I get asked, you know, a lot, and something I asked as well. I was like, well, all right, so we're just saying that like technique doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if your knees go in or out, forwards, backwards, your spine's flexed or extended. Like, so does technique not matter? If I do a squat standing on my head, you know, surely if I want to be in the Olympics, you know, technique matters. Are you asking what me that about? question? Well, I I think yeah. I think potentially it depends, Raf. Um, I'm sure that there, I mean, I know, for instance, I've been learning, you know, I've been learning for a while kettlebells and different kettlebell swings and et cetera. And there's absolutely techniques to that. When I'm doing the, I think it's called the clean and snap, I don't know, the thing where I press it above my head. Um, you know, I've, I've been struggling with that a bit because my techniques, I, I kind of whack, whack my arm with the bell. So I've asked a few awesome kettlebell instructors that I know to give me some tips and they've gave me some great tips which have basically stopped the bell from whacking the shit out of my arm and me having a bruise on my arm. So Mm -hmm. I think for sure there are techniques, but none of that had to do with safety. Safety. It was just like, well, actually, Chloe, if you snatch it faster here and bring it tighter here, well, you're not Mm going to whack your, you're not going to whack your arm. Oh, awesome. Right. So, you know, if we're learning a a certain exercise, a controllogy exercise, for instance, on the reformer or whatnot, well, there's going to be a a part where you, you know, a specific part where you put a body part on the reformer and there's going to be, well, maybe this body part stays straight while this body part rounds or – so there's going to be, I think you've described it before, Raph, like learning the dance, yeah? So if we're learning a controllogy exercise – but none of that's coming down to alignment protocol for safety. Uh, by all means, you know, and again, this is just getting nuanced and I don't want to go down a big grab hole at the end of our podcast, but we've spoken about it before. Yeah, sure. I want my clients to step on the platform before the carriage. Okay. Yeah. Pat, that does have to do with safety because if you step on the carriage first and you're on a light spring, well, there's a potential that the carriage is going to zoom out from underneath you and you're going to fall and hurt yourself. But, yeah, does that answer your question? Awesome answer, Chloe. Thank you, Raphael. Good talk. 
<laughs> really good. Thanks, Raf. Bye. See ya.